Here we go. Here is tonight's session, which is in October 2021. It is part of the big basics of biblical Unitarian dispensationalism, which is a mouthful for some of you who've never been here before, but um, it's an affectionate it's an affectionate uh, title to some of the things we do here because we are dispensational, we are Unitarian, and it's about theology. Um, so here we go. Let's try to let me see if I can get this going. There we go. So tonight's session, part of part of it's part one of why I believe the Bible more literally than you do. It's about a-N-E, Biblical Cosmology. That means Ancient Near East Biblical Cosmology. And Constructs in Scripture. We'll get into all of these terms. Remember, this is a research night. I go pretty fast. And if you want to take notes, it's your privilege. All the PowerPoints, which tonight I think there might be 50 uh, slides, you are welcome to request them as a PDF uh, sometime after the presentation, so you can make your notes there if you want to. But tonight's an introduction, and I call it part one, the firmament, because that is probably one of the biggest constructs in Scripture. Um, I believe the Bible more literally than you. It's just a catchphrase, folks, and I'm sure you will grow to or already do believe the Bible literally like I do, but especially I do when it comes to cause Cosmology. So what's cosmology? I get to go fast through these slides because there's not much to say. Well, here it is. Dictionary definition. Cosmology is the study of the physical universe. So why are we doing this, Bob? The science of the origin and development of the universe, which is a big deal in the Bible. Usually it's a branch of astronomy. It's dominated by modern times by the Big Bang Theory, which brings together observational astronomy, particle physics, the physics, the nature of the reality of the Hebrew and Christian prophet, as well uh, as all the people of the earth 6,000 to 2,000 years ago was different than ours, and God worked with the people he had in order to have scripture written. Well, that means the ancient prophets used physical things to describe what in modern times we would call maybe placeless places or ethereal things such as heaven, hell, angels, even the afterlife. But for them, it was not, as some say, that God pushed the stylus across the clay tablet or made them write what they wrote. No, for them, it was real. And their reality and in their world is what we're going to delve into. One scholar that I remember write, reading said, the biblical writers are forced to use the language of spatiality, uh, height, depth, length, width, to describe placeless places. Uh, the, you know, they call it forced metaphor. Uh, that's just not true. God never forces anything on you, nor did he take over their writing. And that's the breathtaking aspect of scripture writing, which I've got a couple sessions on uh, the YouTube channel. If you want to go there, one of them is called Inspiration in Scripture. You got one more. Maybe I didn't teach it yet, but um, the big deal about God not forcing anything upon the prophet or not moving his hand, um, you know, pushing it across the papyrus, uh, is it's a big deal, folks. Big deal. You'll see that as we go along. So all peoples, all peoples live in constructs in the ancient Near East. And our modern science is not their observational knowledge. Note, I didn't call it observational science. You know, I, I use that term knowledge because, you know, science is really not an issue in the Bible. It's what they saw is what you see is what you get. And you didn't think that the prophets thought this way, I don't think, right? You know, they didn't know that there was Mars, Venus, Mercury, even Jupiter and Saturn in their collective consciousness. You know, we might get into what they thought about Jupiter and Saturn and they weren't <clears throat> they weren't planets, if you will. They were <laughs> stars. In that case, they were a wandering star planet. But we'll get into that sometime in future sessions about, you know, how they perceived the planets. But they didn't think spatially like this. They didn't even know what was outside their universe. Of course, maybe warped time. No, they didn't think about warped time, folks. This is a wormhole. 
gravitational tunnel. Wormholes created between two entangled black holes and that are pulled apart, essentially making a shortcut through the universe. You think the prophets knew about this? No. A hypothetical connection between widely separated regions of space-time. Mathematically, these are possible. So are black holes in parallel dimensions. Is that the biblical construct? We're going to find out. So what's a construct? Because Bob's already used cosmology. That's big enough. Now what's a construct? Well, everybody has constructs. So we're going to get into some of this. Definition of construct is an idea or a theory containing various conceptual elements, typically one considered to be subjective and not based on empirical tested evidence. People live in constructs, both physical and me mental. Buildings are constructed around us and mental pictures are constructed by, oh my God, what we see, conceive or prove by experiment. The prophets saw and thought about lots of things, but were limited by their quote unquote instruments by which they measure. Remember this, not based on empirical evidence. So empirical means it's based on, concerned with, or verifiable by observation or experience rather than a theory or pure logic. Example, they provided considerable empirical evidence to support their argument. I believe those lots of things that the prophet saw are far more supernatural than we currently allow in our two-bit brains. I believe you might agree. We're interested in what the prophets wrote and why they wrote it the way they wrote it. Observational worldview, the world of the prophets. Please remember, many of you have been seeing the prophets did not promote a cosmology as a scientific reality about the way the universe a concept that really wouldn't compute for them, was structure. They assumed the prevalent notion of cosmology as viewed, as that is, seen with their eyes, to teach about God's purposes and intent for his people. The powers that determined what happens in the world were of more interest to people in the ancient Near East than the structure of the cosmos. If you understand the biblical constructs, you can understand better those powers. In this way, we will better recognize how and why things go right and things go wrong in the world in which we live and how we can combat evil and promote God. And then I give you a little bit of data there, but we think, you know, we think everything we know that the earth was 4.9 billion years old and that the closest star is this far away and the universe is this years old. Really? Is this, you think that the prophets cared a whit about this? They cared about God, process, and power, and principalities and powers for that matter. Okay, so we're going to go through a few physical constructs in the Bible. Then you guys know these, but you don't think of them uh, in my terms of construct. Heaven is up. Hell is down. The sun comes up in the east, goes down in the west. There are windows in heaven. And then here's some that you may not be familiar with. The earth is biblically flat, and the earth has ends. That's not a figure of speech, folks. That's why I believe the Bible literally, the way the prophets wrote it. There's a dome over the earth, a tent, a firmament, a vault. You'll see that a lot tonight because that's what tonight's about. There's water, a sea between mankind and God. Is there really, Bob? Creatures live under the earth, in hell and elsewhere. This always brings to mind that verse in, in Philippians, which everybody here probably knows, you know, in the end, those will bow the knee, those in heaven, those in earth, and those under the earth. Hmm. People under the earth will bow. Yes, they are there. And you know a few of these verses about them. But number five, God lives on a mountain in the far north. That's where Eden is. Uh, I have many teachings on that on the YouTube site. You know, God is king in a cosmic mountain way far north. Number six, heaven is not a peaceful place. You may not think of that as a construct, but if you think about it, everybody else on God's green earth thinks it's peace, love, dove up there, and they have fluffy wings and play harps, and there's really, it's God's kingdom. He's in perfect control. He's not. Number seven, God sends lightning and thunder. Does he? Hmm. to the ancient Near East prophet he did. Angels climb it up 
and down to from heaven on a ladder, or as Led Zeppelin said, a stairway to heaven. Don't you love these modern? Anyway, now, there, those constructs related to the body, I think these are important because we'll probably get into this much later in the sessions. There are many more than one or two sessions on these constructs because they're laced throughout scripture. Feelings or desires are in the loins, or more particularly, the livers, kidneys, or the bowels. Thinking is in the heart. You know? Hair is a sexual organ. Oh, really, Bob? Yeah, you know, listen to, um, what was it? Uh, Weird Angel versus number two. It's, it's on the YouTube site. That'll blow your mind. The eye gives spiritual insight. And humans don't have a soul. They are a soul. These are some of the constructs that we have to understand the Bible by, okay? How they view what we moderns call emotions, sentiments, and feelings. Those are those things I just listed. So here's some for modern thinkers, just so you know, I'm not pulling this stuff out of my ears, right? Scientific constructs in the 21st century. There's the Big Bang Theory, right? Parallel universes, wormholes, string theory, supergravity, psychological constructs that you, you, you know, but you, you know, let me just list them. Intelligence or emotions. Can you touch them or feel them or test them? Number two, fate or luck. It's used, but is it measurable? No, it's not. Number three, ego or drive or willpower. Well-being, number four, or life satisfaction. And then my favorite one, number five, libido. How do you measure this stuff? You can't, but people place them in the language and construct things around the words to be what they are. So, um, <laughs> I can't read my top thing there, but I'm going to say, oh, I was, it, here it is. It, it, it was true for the prophets. It is scripture. I believe in the term scripture. I know you guys do too, but this is important. In fact, one of the first things, <laughs> if you were invited into the biblical re Unitarian research group, after you've hung around this, this channel for a while is you have to believe in the term scripture or you don't get in. Um, and that God worked with the prophets who wrote it. And everybody knows first uh, two Peter one 21, the prophecy uh, never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along uh, or be conveyed or born along by the Holy spirit. And I believe that is little H little S Holy spirit brought along by that, which was in them, not overborne by, you know, some form of providential, you know, control that scriptures written. Thus, when something is written therein, in the book, it is the truth. There's no reason to doubt that what the prophets wrote was what their eyes told them was reality and true, whether it be by vision or actual seeing with their eyes, okay? Thus, if the sun came up, from the eastern horizon. There's no reason that this would uh, have been a poetic language to them. It was real, folks. That's why the title is what it is. I believe the Bible literally. Understand, please, that there are figures of speech in the Bible, maybe not as many as you've been told, like especially, uh, what's the one I hate? Oh, idiom of permission. That's a that's a crapshoot. And there are huge poetic sections. This we'll get into a little bit tonight. I could almost tell you um, that the poetic sections in the Hebrew scriptures are close to 50% of the entire Hebrew Bible. But God dealt literally with the prophets. And here we go. Here's two, two that just throw them against the wall. See, as they stick in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, you shall rise early and so forth and so on. And especially and in Jonah, of when the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind and blah, blah, blah. We know these terms as idiomatic. They're figures of speech to us, but they were not to the prophet. Do you understand the distinction? I hope you do. So uh, let's look at a, a couple of biblical cosmic constructs. God's throne. And th look, this might be the most important slide in the setup here because it gives you a, a sense of where we're going to go in, these, in this series. God's throne had its foundations on or in the flood. Think lots of water, not Noah's flood. 
He oversees the affairs of men from that celestial position. I'll give you scriptures here. He sits enthroned, that's like on a throne, in the heart of the seas. He walks or sits on this vault, it's the Hebrew word hug, of heaven and observes our comings and goings. He, quote, spreads out the heavens and tramples on the heights of waves of the sea. We'll get into spreads out the heavens a lot. That's kind of an important part of the firmament. And then there's a dragon making the sea tempestuous. What sea? That's not tonight's session. God rides on the highest heavens. These are quotes. Even upon a swift cloud or in his cloud chariot, possibly a chariot pulled by cherubs, not the kind that are on the greeting cards. These are kind of fierce dudes. Uh, even the children of Israel were not astounded by this image when Elijah went up by the chariot of fire. It was not surprising. That gives you a little sense of the constructs we're going to be dealing with. But I do want you to understand God is not disingenuous. He's not trying to pretend things. He's not trying to pretend that what was written 6,000 years ago, or maybe not that long, maybe 4,000 years ago, was uh, the, the truth of science forever. It's not. In working through the biblical ancient Near East cosmology, the reader of scripture must first understand, there it is, to whom it was addressed. It's not addressed to us. That whom is a scientifically naive culture, and this naivete lasted until the scientific discoveries, discoveries of the Middle Ages. God didn't force or hide the space continued, uh, space-time continuum or the general theory of relativity or string theory into the minds or stylus of the prophets. He worked with what he had. He must not be, and we must not be lazy, lazy in interpretation. I should make that like huge and in bold letters, maybe blinking. I don't know. Biblically, the earth was flat and the notion continued with Columbus and his compatriots until Ferdinand Magellan circumnavigated the globe and proved it empirically. All right. Some of you guys who know science and the history of science know that the Greeks, probably 5th century to 3rd century BC, were measuring the sphericity of the globe. They knew it, but the internet wasn't working. So not everybody knew what they knew. And some of them were like, like no, no, it's not a globe. You can just look over there. It's flat. See, I'm, got, I'm growing my corn over there. You can't tell me that's a globe. And anyway, you can imagine the consternation to those who felt they were math mathematically pure and could prove it. But uh, it really didn't get much play till, you know, Middle Ages, especially the Europeans. Okay, you may now understand the flat earth movement. Some of you, okay, who've heard of it or, you know, maybe stepped your feet into it. They want to stay faithful to scripture, but it, it's all it is, is it's a naive view of scripture. Okay, so I want you to understand again, God is not disingenuous. He doesn't try to show the prophets modern things. Be patient with this ancient cosmology below me. I'm trying to teach you. It's a different way of looking at what is clearly in the scriptures, but not just by figures of speech. As we say elsewhere, I do, uh, we still stay today that heaven's up, hell's down, right? And that's all from the Bible, right? Is it true? Well, hell may not literally be below the earth, and yet that doesn't make it not true for the prophet. There is a hell, folks. <laughs> there is a heaven. And the frame of reference wherewith God spoke to the prophets about it was merely what was available at the time. It's a construct that they, however it came to be, and that's not in the Bible, but however it came to be in the Bible. And by the way, a lot of the ancient Near East cultures around uh, Israel uh, have that same construct. Maybe if we needed the prophets writing about it today, we'd use the term of dimensional space, time, or the fifth dimension, parallel universes. None of these are proven, but they're real ideas with roots in mathematics and science. But it, isn't, uh, it wasn't in the prophets' collective vocabulary, literally, not there. And God dealt with that the best he could. A friend of mine 
<laughs> Michael Northrup uh, just wrote to me months ago and said, you know, this is the most amazing thing to me uh, because it allows the Bible to be the Bible written 4,000 to two, you know, to what? 2,000 years ago, over a period of about 2,000 years, all the 39 books and the 27 books of the Christian scriptures fit like a hand of the gut. They all have these constructs, folks. The earth was flat to John the Revelator, last book. Okay, the ends of the earth are noted in Revelation. The earth had ends, okay? And you could fall off and be eaten by a dragon. But that's another story for another day. So God did not shove the stylus across across the clay tablets or the pens across the papyrus. Now, when I first got into uh, the Bible, um, you know, starting to read it as a, as a Roman Catholic, I didn't. But when I started to read it, Hal Lindsey in Late Great Planet Earth tried to convince me that scorpions in the book of Revelation were cobra helicopters. That's not how interpretation works. OK, it's just not interpretation must be first in light of to whom it is addressed. They did not, they weren't seeing Cobra helicopters. They were seeing scorpions. It says scorpions, read it. Anyway, anyway, here, let's go. So the prophets were scientifically, scientifically naive, but their, their revelation was literal and true to them. I'm an engineer, 45 years in it. I tried to make the Bible fit with my scientific worldview, a modern space-time continuum that had quantum theory, parallel universe, warp time, potential wormholes, and some YECs, and that's the word young earth creationists. I'm not one. Still try this. They assume God reached in, took over the mind of the prophets, and made him write or her write what he wanted so that it fits with modern science. This is not free will, folks. This is not how God works or worked with mankind. They say God created the earth as we know it with the appearance of age. So they can play the, um, play the uh, trump card of you know, young earthism. Or things like starlight in transit and other such, I would say fall or all or BS, but I said nonsense. I did not use the word BS. So even primitive people in the 20th century, I want you to read this. This is a quote from, at the bottom, you'll see uh, L. Le Le Levy Brule. Uh, their cosmology, these primitive people in the 20th century, as far as we know anything about it, was practically of one type up till the time of the white man's arrival upon the scene. That of the Borneo Dyaks uh, may furnish us with some idea of it. They consider the earth to be flat surface, whilst the heavens are a dome, a kind of glass shade a la Ezekiel, I'll just stick that in there, which covers the earth or the glass sea in front of uh, God in the book of Revelation and comes in contact at it with, at the horizon. They therefore believe that traveling straight on, always in the same direction, one comes at last without any metaphor to touch the sky with God with one's fingers. It is the same thing in the Morlock Lock Islands in reply to our question as it as to what land lay beyond these islands. They had some islands in their heads, and that's biblical too. Uh, the native drew a line to the west of them and explained in very clear and simple way that yonder, beyond the Paloas Islands, the dome of the sky was too close to the earth to permit navigation. The utmost that could be done was to crawl along the ground or swim in the sea. And then among the Melanesians of the loyalty, loyalty group, quote, the mind of the Luf, Lift Uan, the horizon was a tangible object uh, at no great distance. Many of the natives thought that if they could only reach it, they would be able to climb up the sky, <laughs> up to the sky. Anyway, such an impression is not pe peculiar to the races of the Southern pa uh, Pacific, which these are all quotes from. It is also to be met in South Africa. Quote, heaven is for them, the Thonga, an immense solid vault which rests upon the earth. The point where heaven touches the earth is called the, yeah, you, you read that, uh, the place where the women can lean their pestles against the vault. These are just some quotes I picked up from an article by Paul Seeley. If you want the article, I'll send it to you. Just email me. Um, so here's, here's the conception that we just read. And it's, it's biblical, folks. <laughs> it's very biblical. 
uh, the understanding of the firmament, which we're going to get into, is what we might call a biosphere, the modern conceptualization of the biblical model of their cosmos, not ours, theirs, was from, you know, as we look at it from the outside, they only knew from the inside. And this is, this is kind of critical, folks. Let's look at this. A dome over the earth? Yes, the firmament. It's not just the King James that translates it that way. What happened on day two? We have light from day one, right? In the beginning, God did this and that. By the time you get to verse six, in day two, well, let's make sure we don't miss the red there in the middle that the Spirit of God was moving over to the face of the waters, and the congregation says, what waters? Where did they come from? We'll get into that in session two. But session one, God said, let there be a firmament. Where? In the midst of the waters. Again, what waters? And let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the firmament. He did what? He made it. And then he, what? he separated the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. It was so God called the firmament heaven. I, I, that's probably another blinking one there. God called the firmament heaven. Probably in session three, we'll get into the three-tiered uh, structure of the heavens. The heaven number one, where the birds fly. This one here, the firmament is called heaven. And then where God lives, the heaven of heavens, also called the highest. Um, this one here in the middle, the second heaven, if you want to call it that, is the firmament. And there was evening and a morning, a second day. There were two sets of waters, right? The one above and the one below the firmament. The rest, the rest of scripture confirms this. Watch the terms as we go along in these sessions. The sea, the many waters, which is literally in Hebrew, the great waters and floods. Ah, there were waters above the firmament. What? You know, we just read all this, right? On day four... At the bottom there, uh, the prophet puts the sun, moon, and stars where? In that firmament. We'll just read. God said, let there be lights where? In the firmament of the heavens to separate the day of the night from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be lights where? In the firmament to give light upon the earth and it was so. Now, Oh, four months ago, three months ago, I did sessions on Genesis 1, 1 through 3, Genesis 1, 2, uh, the days of Genesis. If you want to go deeper into what I teach regarding the days of Genesis, you can go back to the YouTube channel and read all my thoughts about that. But the point here is that the firmament had lights in it. First of all, you know, the other slide said, that the firmament was heaven, or it doesn't say one of them, but it says it, it called the firmament heaven. And then here there were lights in it, not beyond it, not under it, not way out in space and giving their light and it took light years to get. No, none of that. It's the lights that the prophets conceived, in this case Moses, the lights were in it. And we'll get into what that means because, as everybody knows, stars fall in the eschaton. Stars fall, and it's not meteors, folks. Okay, so Bob has, like, added a little bit to that glass dome. As his manner is, he will do this more and more as we continue. Um, the images, the glass, the dome, in some sense, the crystal dome in Ezekiel and other places. Some, some say it's solid. Some say it's made of metal. We'll get into that. Uh, and there's, there's the prophet. Walking on the earth, and there's the water above the firmament and below the firmament, and it's part of the earth, too. But we'll get into this, and I just slipped something in there. I, I was going to erase it because I didn't want to make it too compl you know, complicated, but folks, this stuff is in the Bible. The foundations of the heaven, they're the, the mountains as far off as they could, what, see what was holding up the heavens. Well, let's see another Cons construct that is in the ancient East. It's the one in Greek literature. And this is a very, very rare photograph that I found of Atlas holding up the sky found in the church in old Istanbul. No, I didn't. But 
you'll see some crazy things here. Moderns think that Atlas held up the globe. That's not what the Greek text says, and I'm going to let you read it. So you, here, we think the biblical, biblically, I went back to the other, other um, slide here, biblically, you know, this, what holds up the foundations of heaven over on the mountains, uh, it's just the sky. And that's exactly what the Greeks thought Atlas did. What, the Atlas Mountains? Remember hearing those? Okay, here we go. Little poor Hercules. What, Greek mythology helps explain the Bible? Well, no, but it is. Uh, well, you know, let me just read the, the apple. And some of you maybe know this. Maybe you studied it in your education. The apples of Hesperides. After eight years and one month. Sounds like the Bible. No, in the 10th month of King so and so. Anyway, so after eight years, this is about this is about uh, Hercules. Okay, after eight years and one month, after performing the ten superhuman labors, he was still not off the hook. Uh, Eurystheus demanded two more labors from the hero, since he did not count the Hydra or the Augean stables stables as properly done. You got to get it straight. So Eurystheus commanded Hercules to bring the golden apple, bring to him the golden apples which belonged to Zeus. King of the gods. Hera, why is Bob reading this? Because it's important. Hera had given those apples to Zeus as a wedding gift, so um, surely this task was impossible. Hera, who didn't want to see Hercules succeed, would never permit him to steal one of her prized possessions, would she? Well, those apples were kept in a garden at the northern edge of the world. Northern edge of the world. Just remember that a couple sessions from now. And they were guarded not only by a hundred-headed dragon named Ladon, but also by, uh, by the Hesper Hesperides nymphs, who were the daughters of Atlas, the titan who held the sky upon his shoulders. That's literally what the Greek says, that, that last little blue part there. This is just a popular uh, recapitulation of the story. Um, Hercules asked Atlas to go get those apples for him. Atlas does it, the way to the world and all that, while Hercules holds up literally his end of the bargain. But upon his return with the apples, Atlas tries to trick Hercules to hold up the sky forever. It was the sky, the sky, the sky, heaven, just like in uh, Genesis uh, 1, 6 through 8, the firmament was made. We'll get into it. This is not Right, this mind picture that's on the front of Atlas Shrugged or, you know, in movie theaters and comic books. He wasn't holding, he was on the earth, okay? He was holding up the sky, okay? No globe, right? The Greeks didn't discover the spherical nature of the world until about the fifth century and the internet was down. I already made that joke. The spherical earth and the earth's curvature refers to the approximation of uh, the figure of the earth as a sphere. The earliest documented mention of the concept dates from around the fifth century when it appears the writing of the Greek philosophers, and I, I, I must have taken this from, from Wikipedia because there's footnotes there. Uh, in the third century BC, Hellenistic astronomy established the roughly spherical shape of the earth as a physical fact. Why? Calculated the circumference. how they do this? Well, you want to read up, read up. This knowledge was gradually adopted throughout the old world during late antiquity and the Middle Ages. Um, and the practical demonstration of the Earth's sphericity, love that word, was achieved by Ferdinand Magellan, Juan Sebastian Elcano's circumnavigation of the globe. There's no word globe in the Bible. We'll get into that a little bit because we're talking about the firmament. So the firmament. It's the Hebrew word rakia, and the that's a noun. And then there's the raka, which is the verb form to make firm. Rakia means that which is firmly hammered, stamped is another word. The same sense of the word, a root word in Phoenician uh, means tin dish. That's a, uh, that's a Semitic language that is uh, comparable to Hebrew, Ugaritic, and a couple of other languages in the ancient uh, Northwest Semitic philology, which is my degree, the meaning of the verb raka concerns the hammering of a vault of heaven and the earth as well into firmness. I've given a couple of verses there. You can look at them. 
You should look at them because they make sense. I'm not sure if we go over them tonight. The Vulgate, that's the Latin translation, uh, translates that noun with for momentum, and that remains the best rendering. Even the great RSV translation, that which I used in college and seminary, uh, the first version to use the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it was done in 1952, uses firmament. It's a very good word. And I've given you for your own study, because Bob doesn't just hand this stuff on a silver platter. He expects you to learn and read and look at these verses. There's raka, the verb, and then the verses with rakia. So you understand exactly how the scripture is used, how the prophets used the word. Uh, it was solid, by the way. So let's look at a few scriptures. Finally, we get to the scriptures. Job, very ancient tradition of Job. Can you, with him, God, spread out raka, the skies? Strong as a molten mare. This is a question from Job to, I think it's Job. Well, maybe it's, I didn't put it in here. It might have been uh, his miserable comforters, comforters, you know, you know, trying to put him down, which they did with regularity. Uh, can you, you know, with him spread out? Do you, do you have any idea, Job? Kind of, it makes you think of Job 38, which we actually will not be looking at tonight, where God questions Job, but this is probably one of the miserable comforters questioning Job. And note that it says you can spread out raka or firm out the skies, strong as a molten mare. So Job had a sense that there was something metal about it. And you'll see some of the other usages of the verb, meaning beat out a metal plate. I think you can see some of the reasons why rakia, the firm uh, mint, is something hard, and in other texts is metal. Yes, it is. So here's one that everybody knows. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament, Rakia, proclaims his handiworks. Okay. Uh, just a, a little note before we go on, uh, folks. It's, this is an example of Hebrew uh, poetic parallelism. Glory, the firmament proclaims his handiwork. The heavens tell the glory of God, that they're parallel. The first part of the sentence equals the second. And you'll note the firmament has stars and constellations in it, right? Remember Genesis 1.14? There it is. We'll go to verse 2 of Psalm 19. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night declares knowledge. How do they, there is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the, earth, end of the world. What does the stars, folks, in them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. Notice the, the like, the simile, right? And like a strong man runs its course with joy, another parallelism. It, the sun's rising, is from the, oh, there it is, end of heaven. Heaven has an end. And it's circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hid from its, the sun's heat. So Job knew of both those waters and the heavens we're speaking of, speaking of stretching out Job 9, 8, stretching out the heavens by himself, treading on the heights of the sea. Or in the Septuagint, a little bit uh, more precise, to who alone has stretched out the heavens? and walks on the sea as on firm ground. Verse, uh, the verse uses the verb uh, nata, different one, to extend or to bow, not bow, a bow for stretching the heavens, indicating the action taken by El in Job. It's usually the word El, not Elohim. Uh, in, uh, and you can see that Job is familiar with Genesis 1, 6 through 8 for sure. And it's this, this whole nata verb is used elsewhere and you'll see some fun uh, context here. Let's look at Isaiah 40, 22. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. That's not the word globe, folks. There's just no word for globe in, in Hebrew. And its inhabitants uh, are like grasshoppers. Again, we have the second half of the verse is poetic parallelism. Who stretches, that word nata, or extends out the heavens like a curtain, or spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Remember tabern tabernacle for the sun? It's the same word here, oh hell. Yeah, oh hell, it's the word oh hell for tent. 
who dwell, uh, those who dwell in the tent, you ask me that, who sits in the, who dwells in the tent? Like a tent you dwell in. It's not under, okay? Because we're talking about the heavens, you know, the heavens like a curtain uh, and the tent to dwell in. Who dwells in them? The sun, moon, and stars. They, you have to ask the question, why are they pers a pers personified entity? That's a later session, but sun, moon, and stars could be worshipped. God says, no, 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 in Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 4, and elsewhere. You could worship them. Why? Because they're spiritual entity stars or angels, sun, moon, angelic beings. They could fall. They will fall, along with Lucifer, in the end times. We'll get into some of Barbara's work there. Okay, uh, Isaiah 44, 24. Thus said the Lord, your Redeemer, the one who formed you from the womb. I, the Lord, the maker of all things. There it is, stretching out. Looks like it's a participial usage of verb. Uh, the heavens by himself and spreading. Oh, my goodness. There's the word raka made firm. The earth. So God beat out the earth. Our good friend from Genesis 1, Rakia, a Raka, uh, in verb form, God was hammering away at the earth as well as the heavens. Hebrew parallelism, parallelism takes many forms, by the way, uses similar verbs, then changes the subject from heavens to earth. But the form in the text is easy to recognize. If you want to pick up a NASB physical Bible, it's not always shown in the electronic format, NASB, the New American Standard Bible, and the NEB, New English Bible, and a few others show the poetic form, but you have to get the book form, okay? So, Zechariah, one more. Yeah, we got a few more and we'll be done. Zechariah 12.1, the burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. It's all about Israel. Thus declares the Lord, who, there it is, stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man. Here, the parallel, parallelism adds a third item. But you see, it's all focused on the creation story. We'll call it creation story, the Genesis story, first found in the Genesis record. We'll get into the founding of the earth in a later session. Uh, but because the founding, the laying, the foundations of the earth, it's all building, architecturally, and constructing terms. Uh, but in Genesis, God was working, right? He had the stuff to work with the stuff of that record is available before the days section. Remember that one, verse two of Genesis one, and the earth had become without form and void. It's there, the stuff of quote unquote creation. It's just there. And so we'll get into it, but here's the last one. I think I'm the stretching out of the heavens. Oh, maybe I got one more. I can't remember. Uh, Amos, oh yeah, uh, later prophets. Amos, after after the uh, kingdom, if you will, uh, the northern and southern kingdom were kind of, I think Amos is, Rob can tell me, it's probably like 400, 500 uh, BC, not these earlier ones, but the one who builds his upper chambers in heaven has founded his vaulted dome over the earth. This is the New American Standard Bible. Uh, he who calls for the waters of the sea pours them out of the face of the earth. Yahweh is his name. I might have highlighted Bill's chambers, you know, uh, pours out the waters of the sea. He did that once at Noah's flood, right? Through the whoa, windows of heaven, because the firmament could have windows in the prophet's minds. Now, I, I will say this a million times, but you know there quote-unquote, science is an arts. Deal with the fact that the Bible says the earth was flat. Is it flat? No. <laughs> Proved mathematically, it isn't. I don't care how many pictures you show me. The, 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 you can prove, the Greeks proved it in the 5th century BC. Read the work. Read how they did it. There's great scholarly works on that. Um, and But here, even in Amos, uh, the prophet says, he who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought the seas were on the earth. Not this one. This is the waters above the firmament. It's called the sea. It's called the flood. 
It's called the great waters. It's called the deep. Yeah, lots of stuff to teach you guys. Lots of stuff. Proverbs 8.27. This, this is a great one. I was there, and this is wisdom, when he, God, set the heavens in place, when he marked out on the horizon, on the face, he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep. We're going to get into some Hebrew here. Here's the same verse in the NAS, NIV, NAU, uh, New American Standard, no, universal here. Uh, when he established the heavens, right? I was there when he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. Here, the New Jerusalem Bible, which is a paraphrase, but it did a good job here. When he fixed the heaven firm, I was there. When he drew a circle on the surface of the deep. And then the King James, which everybody usually knows. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the deep. Now, I put them in colors, showed the arrows, blah, blah, blah. The sense is that... It, the most obscure one is the New American. He established the heavens. No, he set the heavens in place is better. He fixed the heavens firm. He prepared the heavens for what? Well, what did he do after Genesis 1-8? Oh, let's see. In, uh, why did I go here? Oh, he sits and thrown upon the circle of the earth. It's going back to, oh, I had something to say about uh, Isaiah 40-22. And it's people like grass grasshoppers he stretches out the heavens like a canopy he spreads them out like a tent to live in uh, one side back we saw that he set a compass uh kjv it might be the best rendering of hebrew engraved a circle might be considered good too for the nasb and njb the keenly observing reader that would be you folks will note that we will discuss in a later session that building terms are used by the prophets and a compass is one that inscribes a two-dimensional circle, not a sphere. Not even the Septuagint translation of this Hebrew here, which is ton guron tes geis, which you can see guron is gyros, gyroscope, but the gyros is not a sphere in their language. It might be to you when you pick one up at the toy store, but it wasn't for them. The Greek word for sphere is sphariya, okay? And it wasn't used in the Bible, ever. Here's what the Greeks thought, and it's very, very biblical. This is a reconstruction of the, the Greek historian Picadius of Miletus, about 500 BC. There is the circle of the earth with all the water around it. Um, we'll get into whether it's got four corners or not in a later session. This is as far as they could get. And everybody knew that there were oceans out there. It, there was an edge, the end of the earth, and that you could fall off. <laughs> it really, oh, look, I left my little marker there. I did, first was teaching this uh, five years ago, right? Um, Psalm 102, uh, 104, 2. We'll, we'll start with one. Though. Bless the Lord, on oh my soul, oh, look. O oh Lord, my God, you are very great. You are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. Love that guy. Covering yourself with light. Remember the father of lights? As with a cloak, stretching out the heaven like a tent curtain. And this tent curtain here is, is typically translated a curtain, okay, that could be pulled back or <laughs> rolled up. We'll get to that. Joe here again. Clouds are a hiding place for him. For who? God so that he cannot see. Why? Why? Because he's above the firmament. He walks on the vault of heaven. That's the firmament, the vault. That, I think, is the, Greek, the Hebrew. There's no Greek in the old part. The kug of heaven, the vault. We'll see in a later session why clouds are important. Constructs. There were constructs for the prophets. Right now, for us, they're vapor. Okay, and they get there, they come together in the upper atmosphere, but not to the prophet. To the prophet, they were constructs. God's coming back on a really dark cloud, throwing lightning. Uh, by that, I mean that other things to them, by that, I mean they mean other things to the prophets, to them, than they do mean to us moderns. The rapture will make more sense to you after we get into clouds. Well, just a tidbit to think about. Here's one in Job. 
God binds up the waters in his thick clouds. That's just what he does. That's what the prophet said. And the cloud is not rent under them. He encloses, encloseth or grasps the face of his throne and spreads his cloud upon it. What? The face of his throne. He can't, just because I know you know this, where's God's, where's God, where does God sit? He sits on a throne. Where's his throne? In a temple. Where's the temple? It's in the far north on a big mountain. And what's below the mountains? Clouds. You can't see his throne through the clouds. We'll get into that in a later session, but I thought maybe I'd just talk to you about it. So, hey, we're getting to the end. In Isaiah 34, one of my favorite contexts, because it's eschatological, God is threatening the nations. Remember, Jesus will rule them with a rod of iron. That's not God, but Jesus will rule them with a rod of iron. And at verse 4, he will make, quote, the skies roll up like a scroll and presumably causing the deluge like Noah's, right? But the rolling up thing, the perspective of the firm sky above the heavens is not so far fetched to the prophet. Might be to you, and you think it's a figure of speech. It's not a figure of speech. It is literally what the prophet believed and wrote. You want to call it a figure of speech in English in the 21st century? That's fine. But it wasn't a forced metaphor. God doesn't force people to. I hate that. You know, images repeated revelation because it's eschatological. The heavens were moved like a scroll. And when it was rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of their places. That's something to do with mountains and islands, which we'll get to in a later session, because they are pretty big in the cosmological understanding of the ancient Near East prophets. So the, the writers of the Christian scriptures, a.k.a. John the Revelator, were no more modern thinkers than the Hebrew prophets. Constructs such as those we will discuss continued across, I should have said ages, times. Here, it's just, I had to put this in here because it's just so cool. Isaiah 34, it's eschatological. Draw near, O nations, and hear and listen, O peoples. Let the earth and all it contains here. Let the world and all the things that spring from it. Okay, that's a figure of speech. The earth doesn't have ears, okay? So that's a you know, personification. That's fine. For the Lord's indignation is against all the nations, his wrath against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. That's a prophetic perfect because it hasn't happened yet. He has given them over to slaughter. Prophetic perfect. It's, that's, a, that's how the Hebrew reads. So their slain will be thrown out. Their corpses will give off their stench. Don't you love God? And the mountains will be drenched with their blood. Oh, listen to this next section. All the hosts of heaven will wear away. The hosts of heaven are the stars, by the way. The angels, they'll wear away. The sky will be rolled up like a scroll. There's that thing I was focusing on. Then the other parallelism, all their hosts will wither away like a, a leaf withers from the vine, and they'll fall to the earth. Oh, that's just Bob sticking his own two cents in there. Or as one withers from a fig tree. For my sword, that's God's sword, is satiated in heaven. What does that mean? It's filled up. Behold, it will descend for filled up with blood, folks. There's blood in heaven, okay? There's blood in heaven. That's another construct. Angels do bad things in heaven not just on the earth. Principalities and powers are buttheads. Anyway, below, behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom and upon the people whom I have, what? Devoted to destruction, those who don't believe God's word. The sword of the Lord is, where it is, filled with blood. It's satiated with fat, the blood of the lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra, a great slaughter in the land of Edom. The language is akin here with those leaves that the scars, stars will fall. We'll get into that. And the withering and falling of the host of heaven are angels or is angels. Okay. Um, great slaughter in the land of Edom. I, I had promised a couple of months ago to do my famous teaching, a good teaching called Jesus the Destroyer, but that's not in this construct section. So with all of this stuff, I want you to look at this next slide because it's real. It's from the Middle Ages, 19th century uh, Flammarion engraving. It's a real thing, folks. It's in wood. Uh, you have to love this. Uh, the missionary who tells the story where the point 
of the sky and the earth touch. And the dude here on the left in the bottom is sticking his head out. Better picture here. Here we go. People like to color it in. <laughs> this, should, he, this was in the 19th century. Uh, I have to say, it was a drawing with, uh, with commentary saying this is what they used to believe. <laughs> then you can see there's Ezekiel's wheel at the top left. There's the sun, moon, and the stars literally in the firmament. And there's the dude sticking his head out. And probably because of that, right by his hand, it looks like there's little frost. Um, and he probably got his nose frozen. I couldn't quite tell what that purple thing was right by his nose. Anyway, this was a real thing. And um, I thought you'd enjoy it. And with that, we'll end this session on the firmament. There's many, many, many more scriptures, but I wanted to keep this short.